so the late Bronze Age through the Iron Ages in the Mediterranean were, as I'm sure most people in the room know, a period of immense transformation thanks to the increased movement of people over land and sea. Um, this culminated in a complex web of interactions in what has been described as the Mediterranean's first globalizing era. Um, this was strongly driven by extensive Phoenician trade networks, um, and through the Iron Age, they established several strategic settlements across the Mediterranean. Um, here, we're going to be talking about uh, the effects of some of the ones that they established in the Iberian Peninsula. Um, with settlement and extensive economic interaction with locals came interpersonal exchange um, coexistence and what some researchers have called a hybridization among both populations as well as was also present in other colonial Phoenician relationships. Um, this study examines how these settlements, interactions, and exchange with local communities resulted in a dietary shift as new consumables and materials were incorporated into local spaces. Um, to do this, we incorporated published data with um, diachronic mapping. And while this is not like an altogether novel approach, we're also going to examine the implications of dietary change on local relationships with and within the environment and how daily life might have been impacted. Um, so first, we need to define some terms. Um, so here, Phoenician is not a self-ascribed ethnonym. Uh, rather, to, rather than referring to a specific group or political entity, um, it comes at least partly from an ancient Greek term that was used to refer collectively to what Michael Dietler defines as the Semitic-speaking peoples originally from a number of independent city-states along the Syro-Palestinian coast whose identities were more locally focused and who likely had no ethnonyms. Um, their settlements, while ubiquitous and heterogeneous, um, are archaeological, archaeologically identifiable through shared similarities with sites in the Levant. Generally, um, that means they're located along seashores, promontories, and or on islands, and they usually have natural protective harbors of some sort. Um, they're also generally subdivided and have separate areas that are recognizably uh, residential, communal, religious, or industrial. Um, and this is also seen in Phoenician colonies. Um, for example, Cerro de Villar. Um, and we can see that through remnants of domestic wares, industrial production constructions, references to and remains of temples to Eastern gods, um, epigraph, epigraphic evidence, and shops with storage and display vessels. Their location near waterways or shores um, it was to maximize trade, however, there was a trade-off in that the land was not necessarily great for agriculture to provide for these settlements. So that uh, necessitated relationships with uh, local communities further inland. Um, there's also extensive evidence for indigenous people moving to and living in established, um, like Phoenician established settlements and vice versa, which is again likely indicative of interpersonal exchange and community formation. So next, um, we'll define what counts as food. <laughs> uh, here, we're going to make the category of any consumable, so that includes beverages and medicines. Um, it can be seen as embodied material culture and a vehicle for memory as well. Um, and there's also this relationship between cuisine and Bourdieu's habitus, um, because what we eat and how we produce, procure, process, and consume are deeply entrenched in our daily lives. Um, any archaeological visible change can be understood as reflecting sociocultural change. Um, while certain cultural products uh, are not necessarily mobile, like landscapes or architecture, um, food is. Uh, it's the direct product of our interaction with our environment, and it's shaped with our relationships with each other. Uh, as people migrated to the Iberian Peninsula, they brought with them not only the actual vessels and foods themselves, uh, but their related preferences and knowledge. We're also going to like just quickly draw a, um, an association from the archaeological record with greyware. It's an invaluable example of a visible product resulting from the intersections of diet and changing cultural expression, um, particularly in an ancient colonial context. It's representative of the introduction of new technologies like uh, the pottery wheel brought by Phoenician traders and settlers to the Iberian Peninsula, um, which were then adapted for and integrated with indigenous material style and form. It's just one of a number of examples that point to a globalizing period in the Iron Age and of this concept of hybridity. Um, there's historically been a binary perspective of colonizer and the colonized with new objects and preferences flowing unilaterally from the former to the latter. 
Um, however, this strips agency from those adopting new external technologies um, in favor of the idea uh, that like change happens to the local culture or is then passively receiving. Um, that's not how it actually happened. Uh, it's a multi-directional exchange. Um, we ex anticipate a similar narrative when ex examining botanical elements of diet and in the ways that time, land, and labor are allocated. I will look into that. Oh. Mm -hmm. Hold my head. Thank you very much. So for this study, sites were selected based on their analytical value which involved considerations of their geographic positions and conditions, their population and establishment histories, and archaeological visibility, as well as on the availability of significant usable archaeobotanical data that was available through published literature. Data were collected for over 70 site and period combinations, but given these conditions, 11 of these were not included in this work. The assembled data were also categorized uh, for chronologically showing pre-Bronze Age, including data from the Epipaleolithic Mesolithic, Neolithic, and Chalcolithic, the Bronze Age, the First Iron Age, and the Second Iron Age. Data from a few sites before the Bronze Age are included here to establish some base of what the pre-existing dietary plants of these areas of the peninsula were, and which subsistence strategies were involved. Furthermore, data were gathered from primary as primary a source as possible, and adjusted as needed if updated numbers were available. In order to consolidate and address variation, uh, the variation present and how data is presented in different works, which is quite significant, measures of plant remains have been categorized using scalar representation, which follows the example of other similar studies that discuss the need for and processes behind the consolidation of archaeobotanical data from a number of sites. Presentation of the data and mapping centered on, is centered on projecting diachronic and quantitative data onto a map. This was done where possible to create a visual representation of how distribution, distribution changed over time, if at all. So the species included in this study were selected based on what was present at the majority of sites, the staples of local diets, and what has been documented as having significant ties to a Phoenician colonial presence and involvement in the broader networks of Mediterranean and European exchange. These have been divided into two main groups, Alea and Vitis, which includes wild and domesticated or imported species of olives and grapes, and cereals and pulses, which also includes local wild and imported species of wheat, barley, oat, peas, and other legumes. Legumes? Who knows? These were then mapped onto the Iberian Peninsula according to the coordinates of their fine spots. Mapping was performed using QGIS, the open source geographic information software. By classifying the fine spots into color coded periods according to their earliest occurring finds, we created a simple spectrum of distribution that we'll see on the next slide, showing where each kind of archaeobotanical datum have been first found. This provides a simple summary of a changing distribution at a glance and can be used in conjunction with migration data to chart how these species may have moved and have been used across space. There's also been a heat map created by summing the approximate quantities of the known finds and using an interpolation tool to create a density map. The intention behind this process was to highlight which areas provide the most weight to our data and potentially highlight areas of greater migration or occupation to be considered alongside archeological, region, uh, archeological information on the region to date. Diachronic mapping such as this allows for visualization of data over space and time. This is best suited for studies looking for patterns or making comparisons on a macro scale rather than site-specific site studies. Well, that's a tough one. These are representative of the Alea and Vetus data, and the figures on the next slide, which we'll show you momentarily, are representative for the, datas for, the data for serial impulses. Overall, the quantity of finds does not universally increase over time, which is somewhat counter to the typical correlation between technological progress, including the spread and adoption of new metallurgical technologies, and general global population increase with increased usage of archaeobotanical species in their respective contexts. However, this data isn't exhaustive, and there is an understanding that not all archaeobotanical materials is preserved well enough uh, to be truly representative of the past, especially on its own. Ah, the mouse is not working. Okay, there we go. So, sorry about that, technical issues. Uh, this is, there is a significant uptick of uh, Hodeum vulgare and Triticum estivum durum during the second Iron Age, uh, associated with the Iberian period that runs into the Roman period. So these are kind of uh, cereals and pulses that are quite common. And unsurprisingly, the highest density of finds are near the coast. Uh, most of the sites are near the coast following the general settlement and spread patterning as previously outlined. 
but this also correlates with some of the most significant changes to the landscape of the Second Iron Age around coastal and littoral plains settlement. And uh, in what is now Catalonia, as more land was being processed and used for agricultural production. Here we also see the shift away from the traditionally utilized cereals and legumes that made up the local diets ahead of Phoenician settlement and towards newly introduced or prioritized species. Based on density, Ole and Vitis species provide a very similar density map to cereals and pulses. This suggests that the presence of these finds was often comorbid, insofar as where there's a lot of cereal there's, or pulses, there's equally a lot of Olea and Vitis species. Perhaps an observation on the quality of arable land at the time could be drawn from this map above anything else. Akin to cereals and legumes or pulses, we see a shift in the species, remain from, uh, species remains from wild and traditionally gathered or cultivated on a small scale to intensified concentration of domesticated species. However, what we see in a more comparative scale is the shift towards domesticated species that require more land and a more intensive industrial agricultural plan. This denotes not only a shift in the production of food for local consumption, but a conscious, conscious shift towards what would become the most profitable crops over foods that would have been less numerous, less concentrated, but more traditional. Okay, um, so the results are largely in line with expectations. Um, there is, of course, the consideration that data from all sites and periods were not available, so, and the general limitation of archaeology's unknowns, um, which may distort some of these representations. Nonetheless, given the Phoenicians' general settlement strategy from coastal settlement, settlements to those further into the hinterland along waterways, um, the development and spread over time of these two groups follow a similar pattern in. The spread of newer domesticated local species follows outwards, and a larger scale study could incorporate the consideration of the relationships between local and Phoenician settlements who are linked through the exchange of raw resources and agricultural goods. Um, the results of this work, the data assembled here, um, could also contribute to a more detailed examination of cohabitation of local indigenous communities and Phoenician migrants. Migrants, wow. Uh, the presence of tenors at a number of the sites, along with indigenous ceramics and grayware, are indicative of a highly personal level of exchange um, that penetrated the domestic space. Changes in the home, especially those related to cooking and eating activities, um, resonate within our daily lives, um, and they reflect changes to social and power structures and relationships around us. Um, the process involved in the production of certain foods also dictate daily activity and the labor time or land resources that need to be strategically allocated or reallocated in the presence of new or changing demand. Um, taste, preference, and cuisine are again guided by sociocultural knowledge um, and provide an avenue for the expression of individual or group identity. However, changes in broader demand can imply a far more utilitarian or economic motivation behind changes, especially outside the home. Um, that also leads to intensified utilization of resources, and that also means um, new infrastructure and architecture to accommodate um, large-scale production and transportation, once again directly changing the local environment um, and how people would have interacted with it daily. Uh, I think we are pretty much over time, and I know we've been running behind, so we can end it there. Um, 